Hello. Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to another lecture here at SciArc. I'm glad that uh, everybody wasn't afraid of a repeat of last week. Um, tonight, I'm very happy to introduce Kit Galloway and Sherry Rubinowitz. Uh, Kit and Sherry are telecommunications artists. I first heard about their work in a journal probably about two years ago, and in reading about them and their work, I immediately I said, no, these are people I want to meet. <laughs> these are people that, whose work I want to see and be uh, exposed to. And uh, actually, they are a major reason why I decided to even coordinate this lecture series, because I knew if I was the coordinator of the lecture series, I could ask them to come and speak. Um, Kit uh, was educated in theater and film at the University of Paris, and Sherry uh, got her BA in environmental design and architecture at the University of California in Berkeley. They've both taught um, at uh, UCLA and Loyola Marymount University. Uh, some of their work includes a project called A Hole in Space, a public communication sculpture, which they will present uh, this evening as well as the Electronic Cafe that was uh, part of the Olympic uh, art series in 1984. Um, Kit and Sherry's desire to learn how to create, and actually in, in their words, to learn how to create on the same level that we can destroy is a desire that I felt just for myself created a, an image and a, a hope that think is very much needed in, in our society and in our world today. And their, their work and their lives, I feel, are um, some, something that we can, can learn from whatever type of work that, that we are doing. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Kit Galloway and Sherry Rabinowitz. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Hi. And uh, thanks for the dinner. It was real good. Um, some of you have seen the Kit and Sherry show before. I hope this evening it'll be a little bit, uh, a little a variation on the theme uh, as a result of some interaction. Uh, we have uh, some tapes that we want to show you, so we really want to get down to the business of doing that sort of like getting that out of the way so we can talk. Um, so the theme that, that the lecture is uh, headlined with is virtual space. And all of the, the projects that we're going to show are really variations on virtual space. And for us, it's going to be fun to talk to architects, because a lot of the, the criteria and the way that we, we design and think of the projects are environmental design, so it will be it will be fun to hear your questions and also to be able to talk to people who have a sense of designing space in the same way that we do. Often, when people call us video artists or artists in general, they don't they kind of lose sight of what we think is the grander scale of the projects, which are in fact designing in this virtual space, this virtual environment, this electronic environment. So each project and each tape addresses the issue of virtual space in, in a different way and explores and develops that space in a, in a different way. Um, what um, virtual space, for those of you who don't know, is sort of a uh, uh, what we consider a, uh, a new way of being in the world. A lot of people, I think, are familiar with uh, electronic mail and uh, computer uh, bulletin boards. Uh, that's an aspect of uh, entering virtual space or a community that's not defined by geography um, in the dimension of the written word or text. Uh, 
In the beginnings of our work, we worked a lot with uh, video, live satellite feeds. And uh, over the years, the work has involved to include uh, many different media that support and surround uh, an individual to provide them with not just one medium for moving or exchanging ideas, but a multitude of them and those that come closer to providing the basic requirements for moving ideas. So I um, think this evening in, in looking at this, this material as maybe a new frontier or a new way of being in the world, a place that we may be migrating to as we're migrating to colonizing space or the industrialization of space. In our opinion, um, the interest in virtual space holds within it the possibilities of people uh, addressing the, the problems of learning to uh, uh, live together, exist together, maintain their own cultural autonomy. Uh, we think that there's uh, another way to go rather than the Orwellian 1984 uh, type uh, control situation. All, all of these projects, all, all of these projects are models and they're models for what we consider to be positive possibility. And partly in our, in our designing or in our figuring what, what could be done, so it was the idea of creating the idea of creating models that offered people alternatives, that offered jumping off places for people to begin to think about how to design in this so-called electronic <coughs> environment, in this sometimes called information environment. And you know, for archite architects to know that usually when you design something, especially if it's going to be a public building or, or a public space, but even if it's a, a private space, you often have to do something called environmental impact studies. And so in a sense, you could say these are models. These are in environmental impact studies for the electronic environment. Um, so with that, do you want to? Well, a couple more, yeah, a couple more things. Because um, I want you to, when you're looking at this material, to keep in mind, um, we work sort of um, like uh, in the computer industry, there's this uh, occupation called systems integrator. And uh, I kind of find that term interesting in that obviously people deal with systems and they integrate them. And I think that's what architects uh, have to do in building models and considering traffic flow and what kind of uh, human business is going to take place and the spaces that they create or whatever the dictates are. Um, and we can consider that uh, also in what we're doing. And uh, in a lot of our projects, we have tried to bring in as many disciplines as possible to explore um, electronic space, to go into it, to bivouac in it for long periods of time, to go in and hang up our laundry and live there and, and, and see what it's like. And uh, it's interesting to work with different uh, disciplines to uh, shop for metaphors for describing these new phenomena or new experiences that we don't have language for. So shopping for metaphors is very important when you're trying to move ideas uh, to people, I would say, like yourselves, who haven't been to a place that we spent a lot of time in. Um, also, just for groundwork, um, we think it's good that people meet face to face, okay? We think people touching each other and being in the same place and all together, like maybe not in a proscenium type situation all the time, certainly, but uh, that's, that's very important. But um, our position is that if we are going to um, creatively manage uh, the human and material resources on the planet that we all can't show up at meetings. I would estimate it would take about 1,500 meetings a week, really, to uh, you'd have to attend to get to some level of uh, uh, multidisciplinary uh, interaction. But So the possibility exists to time shift and to create communities of consciousness that aren't defined by geography, and that's politically, the implications are pretty profound. 
um, the um, the um, the point is that um, to move that the tasks before us in uh, designing alternative futures or re-socializing them um, require that we move at a scale and velocity that can't be accommodated by physical presence all the time. And we found through our work that the networking that we've done, ultimately the consequence of m people meeting people through these devices of our design have stimulated and encouraged people to then go meet each other. These, these constructs, as you'll see, are, are these constructs, as you'll see, are not just the next best thing to being there. Sometimes they're better than being there. And each, each project had a different way of being in the world that allowed people to be with others in ways that are totally impossible in real life, in concrete space. And so in a sense, in one of the projects, it, it gave people a chance to leave their body and to um, join with other people's bodies in ways that just aren't possible, except in a very uh, cosmic, cosmic way in, in real life. Um, sometimes it let, through this, through virtual space, it let people contact and touch each other in ways that weren't possible physically. So in a sense, it's not just, it's not a, um, a substitute. It's its own way of being in the world and it's creating new ways of being in the world that then extend our humanness. Yeah, yeah, to say that this is just a supplement to, um, to our normal way of, of meeting and, and, and discourse is really an understatement. There's, there's a whole lot of opportunities here. So we're going to go to this tape called Hole in Space, which was a project that we did in 1980. And um, it was uh, what it is, in effect, was um, a satellite link between New York and um, Los Angeles. Uh, there were giant screens placed in the Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts and the Broadway Shopping Center in Los Angeles. So they were out in open public spaces. And this was unannounced to the public, and this was set up and turned on, and people on the first evening uh, discovered this window that they looked in where they saw life-size people standing there in which they could carry on a conversation. And then this went on for three days, creating a social situation that really had no etiquette or rules before. And we were interested in seeing how people acculturated that space. Would they mimic television behavior? Would they act like TV anchor men? Exactly how would they um, take to this, this situation? What would be the proxemics? What could you observe as a sociologist as to the group dynamics of people in New York as opposed to the group dynamics of people in Los Angeles? So that's what we're going to look at first. And that's one of three basic projects that we're going to look at. And Hole in Space then is creating with this technology a new social meeting place. So consider that in terms of, of um, a, a design environment. Uh, the other two projects will be composite image space where people separated by a distance enter a live image together and to, by a disembodied effect they share the same image and occupy the same space. Uh, we'll show a project from 1977 and one from uh, 80, 83. And then the other one is Electronic Cafe which is creating within um, indigenous communities uh, a information commons, a place where people can um, use the technology for recording their own history, uh, registering their opinions and remarks, uh, recording their gripes and celebrations, and the same uh, technology can be used for cross-cultural communications, even bridging uh, language. So those are three different areas. Public spaces, entering the image as place that one enters, 
and uh, the more re-socialization aspects of uh, community information centers. So with that, we're going to run a half hour black and white documentation on Hole in Space, a public communication sculpture, 1980. And Nina, if you can hear us, you can roll tape. Kill the light. Okay, I'm going to open up the outside microphone and see if it's hot yet. Okay. okay. Charlie, can you hear me? This is Mark. Yes, I can. Okay. I'm outside, by the way, and you sound very loud and clear coming through. Okay, I'm coming off a handheld inside. Let me find out what they did with the cables. You know, what we really need in here is about five or six more cables. <laughs> That way we'd have an even million. talking to? Are they actors? They look like young people in the show. They're just people like you and me. My God, it looks like chorus line having a little lunch break. It must Maybe be. they just walked by some place and like they're just talking because they saw this talking yeah. side. How did Thank you get you here? They're probably Century City, yeah. yeah. Oh. And they see us. Century Plaza. Oh, Century Plaza. What's that? Century City is what? I don't know what Century City is. I think it's a mall. Oh. 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 Do we know what's going on? Do you know what's going on? No, not really. They're they're in New York. They're in New York? I'm in Los Angeles, right? Are you? <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
je ne trouve pas de mien plus que vous trouvez. by the way they're dressed. Oh, yeah. God, man. It, it looks like, like it looked like it's snowing, really. Yeah, they said it snowed last night or something. Well, more and more people are just stepping up and talking. That's in front of the Lincoln Center. Yeah, yeah. They said the roller stone was somewhere around yeah. there. Yeah, well, the chauffeur was just there. They weren't going to drive the rolling stone. Yeah, that's nice. Somebody hollered to him, bring the chauffeur up. Let's look at somebody <laughs> showed up. Yeah. I love you. I wish, I, I wish I could be on both ends of it. Did you hear what the girl said earlier in the day? Shall I repeat it? Somebody asked her, what, what's your name? She says, none of your fucking business. <laughs> she really is. Did you like that? Very much, very much. Why? I think it's fascinating. Tell, tell me why do you think it's fascinating? Well, is it different? Because it's extraordinary and it's, it's really uh, remarkable. Everybody's enjoying it. Where is the camera picking up? There's a camera in the window here, shooting through the window. And, oh, uh, I see. And, and there's that's mics live? here. There's that mics. Is... It's live in LA, Century City, LA. There's some kid here oh. saying hello to his mother. Oh, and, that's uh, marvelous. His mother's here in New York, and the kid's in LA there. Well, how do you know? What is, it? is this uh, television, like, telephone, right? <laughs> Good gosh. Kind of thing they like what are they doing? They're just shooting from there and then. So it's instant. <laughs> just like sitting on the telephone. That side screen. Good luck. What a revolution that's going to be, huh? Hey, can you tell me if there's a Bonnie Murray over there? Wait. Bonnie Murray. Is he over in LA? Yeah. Where is he? Get him on the camera. Oh, it's my watch. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, how are you doing? Okay, honey, how are you? <laughs> 
It's fantastic. Except they could have done it 25, 30 years ago. Why didn't they? Hmm? 40 years ago, there would have been hundreds and hundreds of people, you know, and like, it's like, it's like a little diversion, you know, it's really, this is so out, you know, and yet it's just like, but Ronnie had, that's all I have to say. About it. <laughs> How did you hear about it? How did I hear about it? A friend of mine um, called me up on the phone and just told me that this was going to be going on. And I didn't even I didn't even know if it was I didn't know what he was talking about. I mean, he tells me all kinds of things all the time, but uh, uh, I didn't I I didn't hear anything about it really in the press or anything. I don't I mean I don't um, I just heard about it completely by chance, you know. And it it seems like most people here sort of heard about that. Are you here the other night? Are you going to get up and sing? Well, let's see, Russ. Sure, come on, come on. Right. Here we go. Here we go. We got hey. something new for you. Look into the camera. Live entertainment. Live entertainment from New York. We gotta sing. Are you ready? All right. We're gonna have New York, New York, live from Lincoln Center. What? Is that better? Yeah. Now, where is it? Is that the camera? No, yeah. The camera's there. The mic's there. I see. Okay. Live from Lincoln Center again. Is that it right down there? Start spreading the news. I'm leaving today. I wanna be a part of it. New York, New York. What? Higher? Higher. Oh, closer to the mic. Get it if I can, I'll be able to find See, they're selling people, they're seeing themselves. Like a screen. Yeah. It's a screen. Is that a screen? Of course, the screen and the camera. Are seeing themselves? No, they're seeing people in Los Angeles. Oh, oh that's in Los Angeles and Santa. Oh, I see. Now they're in Hawaii, huh? Now they're in Hawaii, Los Angeles. He's kidding, you know? I keep expecting to see myself. Hey, LA, what are you guys doing? What? Jingle bells? Okay. Jingle bells? You start. A little early. Ask him. As it isn't Thanksgiving yet. You want to sing jingle bells now? Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Hey. Oh, what fun it is to ride in one horse open sleigh. Hey. Dashing through the snow. Oh, you look great. Hey. Right. Hey. Right. Hey. Right. Hey. Right. I wish right. I could see his face. Take 
two. Okay. Interactive sculpture. Or is it satellite sculpture interactive art? East coast, west coast. I got that part. Okay, ready when you are. This is Peter Bannon at Lincoln Center. I'm going to have the story tonight of interactive art, satellite sculpture, East Coast meets West Coast via live TV. <laughs> Tell your friends. It'll be up again tomorrow night. Century City in Los Angeles, Lincoln Center here in New York. New York time will be 8 to 10 p.m. at Lincoln Center. Ready? Thank you, Peter. Bruce, I can see you. Can you see me? What's the weather? Are like you ready to go? <laughs> the weather isn't bad. Yeah, we'll ridiculous. wait a while. Let's get off. <laughs> see ya. In baseball. She lives in Manhattan and she telephoned me this morning and said, Ma, she said, they're showing it at the right in Century City. Meet me there and say hi to me. So I decided to come along. They're showing what? What are they showing? The white screen and they're relaying it to Lincoln Center. She lives five minutes from Lincoln Center. So I decided to come along and say hi to her. That's great. How about you? Same thing. My mother's there. <laughs> Do all of you have uh, friends oh, yeah. and family there? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can't see you. Oh, there you are. Can you hear me? Oh, can you hear me? I'm <laughs> 
got to see my brother. I haven't seen him in 15 years. Oh, wow. Really? <laughs> he never saw my brother, uh, my son, and I never saw my nephews, but I, I didn't see them tonight, but I saw him. That was enough for me. I got to see my brother, and, you know, it, it just... It just brought such happiness, you know, like I, I, now I can go to bed peacefully. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm in heaven now. <laughs> what gave you the idea to do that? Um, well, I had heard about it from the news and I called, uh, I've been calling, I've been bugging my sister-in-law all day up the news to please come down. But she wasn't sure whether my brother would make it home from work in time or not. Fortunately, he did. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't get to see my nephews, but he saw Johnny, and I saw him, and that was enough for me. Now I can go to bed <laughs> and be happy for the rest of my life. <laughs> I'm in heaven right now. I'm floating. <laughs> That's great. And I didn't need a drink for that either. <laughs> Thanks a lot. What do you think of it? I think it's great. Don't you? Well, you have to see where it can be used. Can you think of a way for it to be used? Yeah. How would you use it? You, you? Companies branches here, company branches in California. They're having a meeting here and a meeting there. They discuss it simultaneously. Is this being bounced off Telstar? Yeah, it is. I can use this in a bigger format than that. Use this in a large audience, give them a whole big nutritional program yeah. and reach a million people this way. That's great. Bye, Jackie! Bye, Stone! This is crazy. And saying too much right now about um, Poland space and the kind of public environment that was, I think we'll just go right on to another kind of virtual space and then plug up all of our talking at the end. What do you think? Ta -da. Okay, so um, let's do that. Okay. 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 Uh, the next stuff. Uh, that we're going to look at. Uh, we go back to 77 and jump over a few years and look at a couple of different projects that deal with composite image space, image as place. But we should say what image. composite image space is. Composite image space is, is um, bringing together two separate camera images. In this case, cameras that are located, in this particular case, cameras that are located 3,000 miles apart away one on the East Coast in Maryland at the uh, Goddard NASA Space Flight Center. Center, right. 
and <laughs> and on the west uh, right on the west coast um, outside of Ames Research Center at the uh, Educational Resource Center that the Catholic Archdiocese right in in Menlo Park. So we had dancers at both ends of the country, and they were brought together live in a composite image. Mixing both live cameras and that live mix, both the dancers saw. So when you walk in front of the camera, you appeared on the screen with the disc of the Cardinal. So you shared the that. So what Let's you see. Let's take a look at it. Right. It's what you see is exactly what they saw. and. The only way they could be together was on the screen. And so the image became the place that they cohabited together. And that's a composite image space, virtual space. Yeah, roll tape. I think it, be, it begins with a demonstration of a. Uh, yeah, this, a, this, a this is a very compressed edit from a longer edit from the Satellite Arts Project. Dim the lights. Uh, yeah. Um, the. First, I think what we'll look at is a demonstration of satellite time delay, um, which is unavoidable. My picture on the right is the live camera, and at the left is the satellite return. That gives you an indication of how long it takes for a signal to leave uh, the surface of the planet, go 22,600 miles in space, and return. Now, this is... Um, the woman with the white hat and the scarf is on, on the, the east coast. On the right. On the right. And she's dancing with the other two who are on the west coast. So she's really alone. When we first began doing this work, after reading tons of material at UNESCO and other part libraries uh, in Paris and in Europe, um, we were looking for some positive suggestions of how to use satellite uh, technology and the arts to create positive models of cooperation. And there were no guidelines or not even any hints of being able to do that. Most of the uh, literature was uh, in response to uh, cultural imperialism through electronics, the rest of the world having to watch I Love Lucy. So we began projects like this in trying to demonstrate cooperative models where artists are cultural ambassadors. Just to say a bit about what you're seeing, is the woman with the hat had to project where her partners would be because she had to compensate the for the time delay. Here, as the 49ers are down. We, six we did a number of experiments Avengers, over uh, a period of a week, Friday well, several Tuesday months Tuesday. actually. And this was to see how complicated an image would become to the point of the communication breaking down. So this is, this is a live a live football game. Yeah, a live football game from Stanford and the both the performers at both coasts were uh, and going into huddles and making plays. This this is the time delay and what Keisha is doing is dancing with her own image, which is being sent up to the satellite and back and bounced back down, and her image is being mixed together. So each redundant image represents the time that it takes for the transmission to go out to the satellite and back. On her wrists are telemetry devices that measure muscle movement, and that's being sent off stage to a audio synthesizer and uh, creating the music. So this is the first time that this was ever done, that a dancer, that anybody, would be performing with their own uh, images of the past coming back from the satellite. Usually a dancer is taped in a studio, and then they go home and go to bed, and the engineers whip it up, and they come and see the result. This allowed the dancer to explore the aesthetic for their own uh, And she could tell the engineers what she was doing at some point. I don't think it's on this tape. She says, I don't like that, change it. And the engineers change it and she continues to dance. Now, okay, now this, we go up to what, 82, 81, some, 82. some stuff. Yeah. 
Uh, this was a multidisciplinary lab at Loyola Marymount University. There were students, graduate students in biology, art history, television, dance, uh, and a number of different disciplines. So what this is, it, the whole class was conducted from two different separate studios so that the whole class for a whole semester, five hours every Saturday, took place within the composite image space. This one side is, uh, you know, the, the people that you see, and the other side is masks, and it takes some coordination. This is more exploration of dance. At the end of the, uh, the lab, uh, this, the final reports, apart from the workbooks that uh, everybody created, uh, the, the final was a public performance that articulated in some way their, their experiences. We got deep into the behavioral stuff, the psychology of uh, this disembodied space, and the, uh, it, it's pretty profound, the implications as a, as a laboratory tool for study uh, behavior. And for experiencing the kinds of experiences that, that they had through the through the screen or on screen um, were experiences that they, they couldn't have in person in real life. And afterwards, all the stu different students talked about how it had changed their life. For example, there was one student. two students that didn't get along in this lab and so we put them in two different places and they had a punch out which was allowed them to be in. There's, uh, there was one student that wouldn't be touched had this problem and uh, don't touch me, don't touch my stuff. And through uh, working in this lab, uh, at the end of it, she became very tactile and was able to sort of explore without the threat of harm venture into solving some of those personal problems. Uh, where, where are we now? Um, Is there Nina, maybe scan. I'm not sure what's, what's going to come up. We may have to go to tape three or whatever it is. Hmm. Yeah, we're going to have to change tapes. So this, these are just very fast clips of a lot of a lot of tape because if we showed all the tapes that's all we were doing this evening but um this this stuff i don't know if you've got a hint of it this compo composite image space of how profound it is and how profound it is when you leave your body when you give uh, without hit. sound low sound a little sound yeah bring the sound <laughs> Now, everyone who's worked with us say that this stuff is very uh, sensual, and this may give you some <laughs> some idea of how what what that might look like. Now, again, they're in two different places. <laughs> it's interesting how things like this bring out intimacy rather rather quickly. These people uh, were acquaintances of each other, but they walked away from this with a genuine experience. <laughs> now, if Bell says they have the best thing to being there, I wonder what this might be. <laughs> then, of course, after this, the convenience of it being two different buildings. Uh, they were able to, uh, after doing this, run and touch each other. Do we want to look at this? <laughs> we have
have special glasses. Now the problem with doing this in 3D is that everyone has to wear funny glasses. You lose that recognition uh, quality of the other person who's wearing uh, either Polaroid or red and green glasses. Yeah, this is, this is the R version, not the uh, Okay, anyway, so. <laughs> what, what's true, and what you kind of get a sense of from watching it, but when you do it, when you're actually one of the participants, each one, each one of the the participants, each one of them really felt it. it. It stimulates a real physical feeling. You feel it, and the next, what you want to do is this. <laughs> it really makes you want to touch. So you see, it's not really a, su a substitute for it, it actually improves. But it kind of warms the process up. Electronic foreplay. All right. The tip of the iceberg of, comp of composite image space. And again, we can talk more about that, but in terms of architecture, the thing to think about is that the image is the place, and any of the video effects that you put on the image becomes the architecture of, of the place. So if you have a split screen, there are only certain kinds of relationships. A split screen is a hard line separating the screen right. into two parts. and That creates one kind of one kind. dynamic or set of possibilities. If it's a, a mixing of both cameras, like what we just looked like, which allowed body parts to pass and mix over, uh, that creates another set of possibilities. And... Uh, and... Uh, there's, so each video effect that you create creates obviously a set of possibilities, like, like a building, what can you do in that place? So consider that. Some of you might venture into exploring some of the corporate uh, or public teleconferencing rooms that exist, and I'm sure you'll be horrified at the way that those are, are set up, uh, and their mission in life is to provide uh, these services that allow people uh, to meet each other. And, and some of them actually turn their meeting room, you know, Hilton Hotels and uh, a number of different hotel chains have these public teleconferencing rooms, often using compressed video, not full motion video like what we've been looking at, but a kind of partial motion where they don't send um, 30 images uh, per second. They send the picture, and then they send whatever changes in the image, which allows them to use uh, smaller transmission lines so that it's cheaper. But in environments like that, uh, the image is very uh, choppy. It's very fine for talking heads for corporate, efficient, electronic business meetings. But um, there leaves a lot to be desired in designing uh, these spaces uh, for services or just, you know, the, the other thing that I think 90, 95% of all the telecommunication rooms do, which is very odd, is that they always have a monitor which shows you yourself. So you're seeing the person you're, you're speaking with, and then to the side, you're seeing the picture of yourself that's going out. So it's like talking to somebody always with a mirror right next to them where you're seeing yourself and you're always making sure that your collar is right. And there's no way that you can have a, a true conversation with somebody when you're always making sure your tie is, is straight and your, and your hair is fixed. There, they, there's they a choice, they but they yeah. don't, um, it, they're it, not it, hip to that. Yeah, it, it doesn't connect with them. If during Hole in Space there had been a monitor in the windows that people would have been able to see themselves, to orient, orient themselves in, in the frame or in the screen, uh, it would have totally destroyed the dynamics that would have taken place. So in that situation, people were not seeing themselves. They were just seeing the other people. And so they bared themselves in a way that you can't get people to behave in front of a camera normally because they totally forgot that the camera was what was making this happen. As far as they were concerned, in their experience, they were encountering other human beings. 
uh, one of tape, yeah. uh, tape, whatever is next, electronic right, this, cafe, this, three quarters. This is a, a short little edit that attempts to document probably the most complex of all, our, all of our projects. And if there's any word that best describes Electronic Cafe, it's integration. It was technically systems integration. It integrated uh, different ethnic communities in Los Angeles and brought them together. It, inter it integrated artists within a community, an artist into their own community. It integrated technology that's usually found in corporate boardrooms into an everyday mom-pa restaurant, family restaurant. Um, it brought together all kinds of, of people and, all, and, and wove them together into a cafe, into the electronic cafe. Plus, I think I said it already, but plus it was, it was state-of-the-art systems integration. Technically, um, there had never been a system that was so, so um, exciting and so complex in terms of what could be done. So with that, let alone being placed out in the public. Um, well, I guess we ought to do because it's not on the tape. So Electronic Cafe was um, the idea of uh, a commons, a community resource. Uh, we feel that um, it's, it's difficult for the teleconferencing industry even to market this, uh, this technology because people don't understand what the values are. How could they use it? What could I use? What would I do with this? And there's, um, they say a lot of people don't need it, don't want it, but um, there's, um, when you've had the opportunity to have your imagination liberated by spending time with this stuff, as these people did in the Korean community and South Central, black community, East Los Angeles, the eclectic Venice Beach community, and the downtown museum, which was situated, the Museum of Contemporary uh, Art, the Temporary Contemporary, sort of between Chinatown and Little Tokyo. Um, that created for us a, a model, using Los Angeles as a model for an international cross-cultural network at a manageable scale. So we were dealing with different cultures, different uh, attitudes towards technology, different languages, and the, the system was basically designed for the community, as I said before, for archiving, for record keeping people, creating their own history with this technology, and then the ability to meet people and venture into part of the cities or communities that they may not ever think about doing it. And to do it was, uh, in many ways, uh, opening uh, uh, people's eyes. And this was up for uh, six days a week for seven weeks. Six hours a day. And when it came time to take this away, because we couldn't perpetuate it, because the technology that we used in 1984 was not the technology that you would say, here, let's clone this as a system and have it reproduce itself, because uh, it was of like seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 worth of equipment. Per site. Yeah. And um, so essentially what you'll see, I think, from this tape is people using um, equipment that allowed them to use a video camera to grab still pictures of themselves and transmit them back and forth to talk, voice conferencing. All the locations could be heard simultaneously. So they were acoustically linked, if you will. Uh, the ability to use a, a writing tablet and that people could write and draw together, which was great for accommodating oriental character sets like the Koreans used. It also provided people with a way to get involved in the system without having to know how to use a keyboard, which is really a small percentage of the population. So uh, that intimidation factor was uh, put out of the way. It was a computer system that allowed people to leave messages uh, open topics of discussion, conferences, register their opinions, and uh, the ability to combine the drawing and the pictures. And in East Los Angeles, they were fond of doing photo novellas where they would maybe act out a drama, take a picture of it, 
and then they'd draw in the uh, caption uh, balloon and make stories <coughs> that way. But a lot more happened in terms of uh, community politics, cross-cultural uh, politics, and people meeting each other, and essentially the purpose of creating an environment where people could work on collaborative projects uh, together. So there's a quite a smorgasbord uh, here, and it's a little bit hard to, to wrap up. There's many, many. This is like everything we had thrown into one um, one kind of uh, situation. So tape. let's shut up and watch the video. Roll tape, Nina. Dim light. This is short on. Whoops. Wrong. No. Oh, neat. Let's go. Yeah, go to the. It's a one hour, three quarter inch. Maybe right. we have to see. Maybe this is our fault. The the last tape, whatever number that is. Yeah, I think we we're supposed to switch tapes. Yeah. The concept yeah. is called the Electronic Cafe. Can you of bring the audio up. Arts Festival. We want to in it. Yeah. Video cameras, computers, and message boards are used so that people can now have that leisurely cafe-type interaction with other people miles away at other locations. It's a uh, unique telecommunications network and archiving system for communities and for cross-cultural communications. Customs, he came one time, you know, that he, he told somebody else, he come in more people. Electronic Cafe, is, though it has a good ring to it, I think, really came about by describing what the system is. And we designed, we designed this communication system to, to facilitate as many different kinds of communication as possible, and in a sense to emulate a real cafe, a real cafe in the sense that you can walk into a cafe and in one table people can be having a serious conversation, in another table people are flirting, somebody else is just watching what's going on, somebody else is writing poetry, somebody else is drawing something. Some all people the, are actually eating or drinking. Right, good point. Yeah, all those. <laughs> That's the control is at the Museum of Contemporary Art downtown in Little Tokyo. Uh, that's where the uh, brain, uh, the the control for the computer is, the video disc, and uh, that's the first locale. Uh, then we go east uh, a little further to 8th Street on the corner of 8th Street and Normandy. That's the 8th Street Koreatown. We have one in East LA, which is in Anna Maria's, which is basically uh, a Chicano base. Uh, place. We go uh, a little further west in South Central Los Angeles to the Gumbo House, which is New Orleans style food. And, and then finally we have um, uh, Gunter's restaurant in Venice. This is uh, an ordinary camera, black and white. And the camera then goes to uh, this device on the table here, this robot research slow scan transmitter. You push a button, it will take still pictures of it, which can be transmitted or received. Now, this telewriter here is a French-made device, and um, it is a, a teleconferencing device, and he is writing with uh, one of the other restaurants. What we have here is a computer terminal, which is connected uh, to, and all cafes have a terminal like this, uh, that's connected to a mini com computer by Plexus. And uh, there's a, some software running on here called Community Memory. It's designed for being set out in public places, which allows people to, to put in uh, ideas or information, uh, to participate in conferences or topics of discussion. And if there's nothing there that they're interested in, they can open their own topics of discussion. Each of these devices have a telephone, and you push an auto dialer, which lists all the other cafes, and it'll make 
voice contact and you talk to a person and decide what it is that you want to do and then you just you go ahead and, and transmit and receive. He wanted to put together a system with these graphic capabilities that would make it possible for people to have a conversation that could bridge language. Um, you have people that are like an Easter later interested in like photo novellas and different other types of uh, cultural expressions that that community is about. The same thing in Koreatown in terms of the whole Korean uh, way of expressing themselves just in terms of mentioning those two communities in particular because from those two communities is where we've been getting the most input in terms of foreign language uh, you realize that the, just the ability to, to communicate on the visual plane tends to help us democratize those issues that get lost when they're put out in the didactic written form because if a person comes on and they start talking to us in Korean, or even if they know that we don't, which they do know that we don't speak Korean, they can talk to us in a visual context with the slow scan. So again, we're able to bridge, you know, we're building bridges, we're bridging those boundaries that, let's say, are in the, in the world right now that naturally keep us from being able to communicate. So people who are from in the Spanish community can communicate their expressions. They do a very interesting way of doing that just in terms of the drawings that they create. And when we draw together, we get even more of an experience about what we're trying to say to each other because that becomes a universal. I mean, everybody in every culture doodles. I can just put it on that level without trying to make it so grandiose. All these pictures on the walls here at Local Represent are just you know, maybe 1% of the transmissions and the prints that have been made over the system. Thank you all, we'll read uh, one last poem then. In the interest of getting the business taken care of, I would be very much interested in any dialogue or discussion people would like to have over the content of the poetry, maybe the ones that I've chosen people uh, may have difficulty responding to. But Special. Hello, I'd like to say thank you for all of it, and especially the last one. And one of the things that was most exciting for me was that when we asked for poets here in Gunter, Gunter's, that you responded at Gumbo's. And that really brought it alive to me. Orlando, I thank you too. This is Francis, also with Gunter's. People have said to me, is he going to read any of his own stuff? I know that you must be a poet. As Dealing with the unknown. I think that's one of the biggest fears that we all have. And this certainly for a lot of people has presented and not an unknown to a certain degree, but the, the apprehension level that may have been, or that is, let's say in society, about the, the rumors that the high-tech world is, is on the horizon. And when we're sitting around here, it's not on the horizon, it's here. So they, people come face to face with that reality and we start from there. So okay, end of tape. The end. <laughs> yes. Cement mixing with uh, Alfonso Amici. So we can have, ah, uh, great. So that was a really uh, compressed clips of Electronic Cafe. And if it, if it gives you a sense of a lot of things happening at the same time, and uh, you don't know exactly where you are or what exactly is happening. That's exactly what was going on because 
at five different restaurants, there were the possibilities of five different communications happening all at the same time. So it was like any cafe where the, at, at each table, people were talking and different things were going on. And one person was talking over here. And you and I talking didn't have anything to do with the, those two talking. So that's what Electronic Cafe was. It wasn't a linear one thing after the other thing. It was an environment that was designed to facilitate communication and creative communication across a this, multitude of a multitude media. right the across um, distance there was also the ability to uh, through a conferencing bridge for any of the uh, any one of the cap uh, in the morning people would sort of sign on and get oriented and the gumbo house would say well today we're having the Nairobi dance company here that's touring the United States and they're going to drop by the uh, our restaurant and perform for us. So these places sort of became the cultural centers, if you will. And they, each different place would have maybe an agenda of special events. And um, so any one cafe could send the video images and the sound and the drawings and all of that in a broadcast mode to all the others and they could receive it. So there was a broadcast capability designed into the system. Now, if people didn't like what they were seeing, they could just drop off and dial one of the other cafes and draw together. So, you know, it wasn't required viewing. But the real power of Electronic Cafe was the way it brought communities together that were not, not only did not talk to each other, but in many cases were actually enemies or were afraid of each other. Um, People from East LA did not go into Koreatown. You know, you didn't go on, Olymp on Olympic Boulevard. You'd get your tires cut. They were, there was animosity. Um, well, Korea, people from Koreatown didn't go to South Central to the black community. So there was a lot of, of fighting. And what Electronic Cafe allowed, which was similar in a sense to what Hole in Space allowed, was by having the physical presence separated by not having physical presence, but still being able to communicate and exchange ideas, exchange information, play together, create together. It, it created a bond. It created a friendship that wasn't, um, that, that wasn't held back by fear. You know, there was no fear. The fear of harm was put aside, and therefore, people could start to communicate. And the upshot of that was the electronic cafe community, which spanned Koreatown and East LA and South Central and Venice and downtown, and which I think even after the system was down has maintained itself to a certain extent. Um, so um, again, there was then after people meeting in a situation like this, it often then results in a certain ground proof or actually meeting that person. So school teachers would bring the class in and children would, would work with the writing tablet and they would find out why it's important to know how to spell because if you don't know how to spell, you know, you're not, you're not going anywhere on this uh, too much. Well, of course you could draw and a lot of that went on. But then the children would meet and make little friends and they would get bussed around and shake little hands you, with right. those little people. and. Other people would fall in love and, uh, you know, drive from East L.A. to uh, Venice and, you know, go sail away in the sunset. And, and when you ask the kids what they liked about it, I mean, here they were, they were faced with state-of-the-art, excuse me, state-of-the-art equipment, right, $70,000 worth of equipment. A, a few of them were right off the assembly line. We had numbers uh, one through six. So they were faced with really, you know, high-tech equipment. And when you asked them, what did they think of Electronic Cafe, they said they liked meeting people. They liked making friends, the friends that they had made through the system, which meant that they weren't, that it had succeeded in the sense that they weren't encountering technology. The technology was the channel through which they were encountering other people, and through which they were making relationships. And that's what's important, because the technology will always change. It's going to get smaller and cheaper and prettier, but the way you apply it is what's important. You know, 
the images that they have in their heads that they carry away and they know that technology and computers aren't just for uh, doing your arithmetic, but that you can talk to other people and make friends. That's the important thing, not learning how to work a computer, because you know, that doesn't make any difference. It'll all be there. So in the evolution of computers, we see you know, com from computer games to you know, word processing and the acceptance of that and all these other vertical applications and spreadsheets and into the business world and now uh, electronic uh, publishing and all this, uh, I, you know, good reasons to have this kind of technology. It hasn't quite evolved only theoretically to the point of, uh, and this is what we're interested in, and that is the design of desktop or personal, eventually, uh, teleconferencing uh, terminals. That way, that portal for being in the world, because in the end, you have to determine what are the basic human requirements for moving ideas back and forth to create a congenial, workable uh, space and the kind of skills that you need to have to participate in that space. And um, once all of that work is done, essentially, like the people at Electronic Cafe, what they discovered was that they went through these gizmos and were essentially confronted with another human being. And that's where the work, you know, that's where we come back to. That's where it all begins in the relationships that we can establish, maintain, and, and nurture and the cultivation of that process, but on a larger scale. So essentially, we took the cafe as a tried and true sociological institution where people meet, cross, fertilize, uh, conspire, eat. And we stepped that up to uh, contemporary scale and velocity, which is required to manifest the kind of communities to uh, have an effect on um, empowering ourselves uh, politically and economically. But bring, bringing this back to virtual space and um, architecture, or the concerns that architects have or environmental designers have, I think that you can see that all three of these projects bring up different aspects of virtual space, of electronic space, and also, I hope, show that, that this, this is really an exciting place to be. This isn't just uh, you know, working with technology or doing video. These are real places that we enter in a sense you know, you talk about virtual, and it is, in a sense, they're metaphysical. They're above the physical. They're a metaphysical cohabiting environment. You know, and they carry that metaphysical environment carries some of some of the thoughts that we think of when we hear the word me metaphysical. Um, you can approach. I, you know, we have, and I think you can approach the the question of virtual space from a very practical sense is how, how do architects design now at, a, at the contemporary velocity that, that um, contemporary commerce operates at. You know, you have to design buildings and situations that, that accommodate that to all the way to the, the image space where you get to meet your image ambassador. So right now architects are working with CAD systems, computer design systems, and Within those programs, there's uh, number-coded structural analysis, which speeds up the process of design. So right there, they've got a front-end system into uh, exploring the space by adding maybe some different cards into. Um, it's really not much of a step to move, uh, move into that. Architects are dealing with now the, uh, the need and the codes for designing intelligent buildings. Um, and there they have to interact and do the systems integration with uh, the phone company and other telecommunications uh, entrepreneurs as to how do you make a building smart, what is a smart building, and, uh, and how do you link one smart building to another smart building in another country, I mean, what are the standards problems. Um, when one thinks of the, what's, 
I don't know if it's still called, but the idea of the furniture of the city, you know, the park benches, the trees, uh, uh, all the accoutrements and that kind of stuff. When one began to design city planning and all of that type of stuff, um, consider possibly um, a situation like electronic cafe that can be brought into a multicultural environment and such a system can s stabilize, disarm um, situations, not internationally, but also within, within communities. So it can be looked at at the micro uh, level, at the sense of the in the sense of the community, as a resource for the community in managing uh, their resources. Chinatowns linking with other Chinatowns and metropolitan centers and work a skills exchange. Oh, you had this problem too. Here's how we solved it. And the real interest is in maintaining these cultural autonomies rather than this process of the great melting pot where everyone begins to sound like uh, an AM radio station. I don't think that's uh, the promise that's being held out there. So um, I think architecture, we'll turn it, we ought to turn it yeah. over to question. We can, can we just, just say this one last thing, which is architecture has always been in balance or in response to the local, econ local economy. It's always been in scale with the local economy and that's, basically how architecture, is my understanding, my slight education of it, has grown. And as the economy has moved into the speed of light economy, the, the electronic economy, so architects are going to have to be, begin to think of how to incorporate this new, this new commerce, this new scale of the economy into designing space. Because large interest concerns multinational corporations who are um, using this technology as strategic defense uh, initiatives to uh, maintain uh, control of their special interests. They are acculturating virtual space. And there's a clash that exists in that the corporate culture and its meetings and hierarchical structure has a de uh, problem coping with the decentralization or dissemination of information where a lower manager can talk to a, a higher manager. But nevertheless, they're the only ones that can afford to acculturate this space. And it's very much like the military um, acculturating um, lower orbits and um, outer space. So we think that looking inward, that the real interesting new frontier is acculturating virtual space people doing that. So the whole issue has to become politicized as to what does it mean to deregulate the telephone company when all of the entrepreneurs are busy trying to deliver goods and services to the high-end corporations while we, the end users, are sitting there with copper wires rotting in the sunlight. Uh, the concept of equal access, which gave birth to the monopoly of the phone company at the turn of the century, was a concept of equal access. Everyone should have access to this technology, so the way to do it is to cut the chaos and let there be one monopoly ordained in our capitalist society that would provide those services. When they cut the ropes on that, it's thrown us into sort of a bad situation. I think we let the magic of contemporary reality, the ability to pick up a telephone and talk to another person on the other side of the planet, that's species modifying stuff. And if we let that go and just sit back and wait to consume the communication revolution, I think we're going to find that it's going to cost a lot, come too late, and uh, all the rules will be defined. Because right now, legislation is being established in a reactionary sense as a result of hackers getting into communication system, defense, uh, computer uh, uh, systems. And our freedoms and rights and privileges and privacy are all being written away. And this is, I think, in, in our opinion, for the human agenda, politicizing what it costs to telecommunicate because the, the economy that was established on the road system where you paid taxes to keep the pot hill, uh, potholes filled is, is kind of a good idea 
In other words, you, the meter isn't running every time you're driving on the road like you're in a cab. But now to telecommunicate, it's like driving in a cab. The meter is always running. How can we build or re-socialize in an environment like that? And uh, I think there are reasons that it's being uh, developed that way. And uh, it's very easy to do that because everybody's too busy doing, trying to stay off of, out of tents on Venice Beach to concern themselves with what seems to be esoteric issues. But if we can create an environment, the context in which people can re-socialize, create communities of consciousness that aren't defined by geography, maintain autonomy and market our goods and intellectual properties over an environment like that, then we don't have to pay for advertising, we don't have to pay for storefronting, we don't have to bear the costs of going into business, we can all open shop. And uh, that's a pretty scary proposition to some, some people that kind of control this. So there's the political angle and there's also the dark side, which Herbert Schiller uh, writes about, and uh, he basically moderates the, um, the language and the responses of develop people in developing countries who, um, who have a, rightfully so, a negative attitude about all of this. Because in our country, we have a, we, after World War II, we said there should be a free flow of information. Well, that was good for Hollywood, who was pumping out all of this information. And the other countries couldn't afford to originate programming or compete or create a balanced world in that environment. And we also have a policy of first come, first serve and satellite parking spots over the airspace of other countries that can't afford to launch a satellite right now. A country comes to us and the World Bank and say they want to borrow some money against their corn crop and we show them a satellite picture and the locust is flying in your direction, Jim. You don't have a cash crop, okay? You're out of here. So. Uh, it's a little, little unbalanced, um, what the point. So the point is that uh, there, there's a whole lot of stuff uh, about all of this, and it's real important. And to take food to people who starve as a, a response after they've starved or uh, this sort of uh, ritualizing that's going on with satellites right now and using satellites to um, have uh, Vladimir Posner and uh, Phil Donahue, Ted Koppel, all of the usual players. Uh, this is a, a step in the right direction. It's good to evolve that, evolve in that direction. But that's just a ritual phase. And uh, it can be dangerous if we are led to believe that that's sort of an improvement in the world condition, that the work before us is much more complex than, than that. Um, so. I think that uh, architects can begin to concern themselves with this, and, uh, and artists as well, and many other uh, disciplines, because um, it's really creating, I think, uh, a hope. And our ability to use this technology to creatively manage, uh, not manage in a negative uh, sense, but in a creative sense, then uh, I think our ability to do that, to work with this magic, is either going to be our um, legacy or epitaph. So with that sober remark, let's uh, Take let it fly. One right there. He was fast. We're now uh, to, uh, after Electronic Cafe, we decided that, well, hell, if we do all of this work, uh, it seems like we could do this much work and um, and do it on a permanent basis. What we're in, we have evolved to the point to what we call the limits of models in our particular work or practice. So we see the next step as doing the technology, the hardware systems integration to provide a widget, which uh, is a widget that can be cloned and duplicated internationally and manufactured in different countries because why would a country try to liberate itself for 200 years and then uh, buy a telecommunications infrastructure from the United States? You know, it doesn't make much sense. That's the way business figures it's going to operate, but it's not true. So we're working on a project called Electronic Cafe International where we design the system and install them uh, in places like Moscow, Paris, uh, Toronto, New York, Los Angeles, 
Sydney and um, Tokyo, for starters. And that's been commissioned by, or started yeah. out, initiated. The, the puzzle is coming together. Uh, it, it's, I mean, we're ready to shake and bake, just add money. But that's the problem. <laughs> But we want to build not a, we don't want to, uh, we're, we've done enough testing. We've proved our theory. We've done the environmental impacts st uh, studies. We have enough uh, people giving testimonials that we're ready to uh, build a utility, a prototype environment in which everybody can sort of step into defining a telecommunications revolution uh, together in sync. And then we keep developing the technology, our system, so that it talks to older technology that can't talk among itself. So we uh, bring that in and then uh, keep pounding on it until it can be uh, within personal range, because until it reaches the capillaries, okay, end of um, I got handed this. Sue. I've got two questions, uh -huh. I don't remember them. Um, the first has to do with, I can imagine, that it would be a very therapeutic, uh, internationally therapeutic situation to get Ronald Reagan and Daniel Ortega in the same virtual space. But I can't imagine how to get them there. I mean, willingly. Uh -huh. And I wonder if you have any, have you could it be done? Uh, that would could it be done? Uh, let's see, what's the term? Yeah, like? surreptitiously. Uh, yeah, uh -huh. we, and with x ray, you know, so you can really see, see there. <laughs> but I, I, you know, they, who knows? They may, uh, the thing about being in virtual space is that it's so physically safe, you know, and um, they may, they may in fact do it. But there's the other, and as I understand it, and you've probably heard this too, that uh, for instance, there's not the red, there's not the hotline between uh, the White House and the Kremlin, that it's actually a uh, telex machine because, um, neither nation can cope with the consequence of the two leaders talking to each other and getting vocal cues as to their uh, stability, um, the belief in what they're saying. Uh, this so they want to separate the human element and just have the communications to be small bursts of uh, yes, no, launch, don't launch, uh, just you're out of here. No yeah. So, um, but I think all, all things, uh, things are possible. I don't think we have the players right now in the world. I think Gorbachev is probably the most interesting leader on the planet right now, you know, as long as he doesn't become the Soviet's answer to Robert Kennedy. But um, I think he might be interested in doing this. And there's certainly a lot of manufacturers that have the equipment that's working on video compression devices, and they got a new widget, and they're looking for some public relations angle to market their product, and we talked to them. They said, hey, can you get Gorbachev? And can, would Reagan phone Gorbachev on our widget? I mean, we'll give you the equipment. Well, of course they'll give you the equipment to the deal. Will they do it? Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's some of the work to be done, you know? And you had another question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they kind of forget, always forget that part. Oh, that's automatic. Automatic. Well, well, that brings up, during Electronic Cafe, there was a, uh, uh, an architectural competition, charrette. charrette, at the Museum of Contemporary Art, which was where the Electronic Cafe was. That wasn't a community. That was the place where the international visitor came and he could sort of electronically uh, tour Los Angeles without getting his tires slit or something. But during the charrette in which the, the, um, the, the five or six different architects teams came in 
and did this project to redesign like 15 acres of downtown Los Angeles. So we're taking a camera and shooting the drawings and sending them out to the cafes and people are saying, oh, okay, we've changed this like this and draw this like that. And it should be like this. And people were like uh, redesigning and saying, you know, they're, they're full of crap. It should be tall and pointed and no, it should be deep with a hole in it. And, and um, sending all of their stuff back, you know, on the charrette. And the same thing happens in this environment for artists who came to an electronic cafe and presented their work, usually used to presentational type stuff. This is my work. Let's have a discussion. They were sending out their slides, pictures, videotapes, poetry. People were receiving it, drawing on it, changing it, sending it back to them. They said, wow, that's not too bad. And they had the experience of what we're talking about, and that was having, reaching this dimension of having a conversation among and within uh, their own artifacts. But so even that's with, off of your question, right. but sure, but, there needs to be yeah. a context in which these discussions take place, and only in a public, informal network, and that's what unions have been, and, and where the real sort of power can come up is when people get organized in informal networks, often really can call the shots, as opposed to uh, you know the official, uh, official line. So, you know, the more of this there is, uh, in theory. Um, but you could have electronic cafe systems between the teams that are working, you know, and just let a constant conversation happen and a layering of uh, information taking place. That would probably be one way of, of doing it holistically, just by having a number of layers simultaneously uh, working. Well, marrying electronic cafe, as we've seen it this evening, into uh, databases and information services, which is another scenario that we have in storefronting all of this computer power. You don't have to own a computer. You, know, you want to know what the, what's in the prescription that you just got from your doctor to give your kids. You walk in, you put $3 on the counter, and uh, a trained uh, information shepherd will retrieve the information and will tell you, uh, you, know, you know, hang upside down, drink lots of water, and it'll be OK. So you, all of this specialized uh, kind of information be um, all wired into this, but we have to have a national policy in getting access to, to that kind of stuff. Were there other, another More? question? Over there? Uh, I have a comment and, and oh. two questions. Uh, I remember uh, about the, say, the Reagan. Uh, I can't hear you very well. Okay, the Reagan Daniel Ortega uh, question. I remember, uh, if you'd like, um, a computer artist who would take features of faces. Of the nuclear powers? Yeah. Am I ahead of you? Yeah, and then use a made a composition of all of the nation, national yeah. leaders that had nuclear power, and it created Big a brother. golden yeah. mirror that looked like a the Brezhnev. world dictator. Yeah. 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 Sure. Uh, these are all uh, exercises that are important ones. There's, you know, there's many individual uh, efforts that. Um, that the was, problem, that was yeah, a little just, different. Just a comment on, on yeah. her question. But I do have two questions. One, are you familiar with the IDSN uh, protocol? Yeah. Uh, OK. And is this what you're going to work with in the future? To, uh, so the the integrated digital, digital services, services network. network. It's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a carrot. It's kind of real short. It's, uh, it's a. Uh, it's an attempt to organize. Uh, there's a battle between the Germans and the French in the usual scenario where we want to say what ISDN is. We want to, we're Siemens of Germany. We built the switch that makes it all possible so that the, the end user can buy our uh, services to send video and voice and data and these multitude of channels simultaneously from their home and then be multiplexed to a switching center, which breaks what, them out and let me, let, let me finish. So that is a scenario for, for providing these universal services, that environment. Well, what's interesting it's about bias, that is uh, that I just it's got, it stinks. <laughs> it's bad. It's not good. But what's interesting about that is is that all of the large corporations now, they're they're um, 
copywriting and trade and trademarking protocols. It's a business. It's a business, and the business is virtual. Yeah. They're not. They're not uh, copywriting or, or uh, trademarking products. Software. They're, tra they're trademarking processes, Standards. and that's that's where the real estate is yeah. now. Protocol. That's that's yeah. the main real estate they're all in. Is, How your data is chopped is up. Is owning packaged. owning okay. uh, dance steps. We don't want that. We don't want that. That's, you're absolutely right, but who's going to decide what those standards are and what is the process of designing those standards and well, as who long allocates... As it's my standard, it's fine. Who allocates frequencies for radio stations and who, who moderates all of this uh, for us and uh, how much of it should happen over the air and how much of it should happen. All of these things are... There are certain things uh, that are so important to the species that they shouldn't be... Uh, delegated to uh, the institutions that have been pretty much fumbling the ball for the last uh, 75, uh, hundred years. The, uh, look at television. I mean, we pay taxes. That develops technology. A lot of that money goes into defense. The defense industry is the only people that has remained true to the future of desire of information technology. They can see from space. They can get information from here to there. They can remotely operate and uh, information retrieval and remote monitoring and all that kind of stuff. And what did we get? Television. <laughs> you know, now we needed a market to build the technology to make a lot of tubes to sell tubes because uh, when we went into war, uh, they wanted to make radar tubes cheaper, so they had to create a market. And all this stuff is tied together. And basically, we're, they're taking our tax money giving it to contractors to develop satellite technology, for example. Then they launch satellites and give us a whiz-bang show, and then we have to rent satellite time? I mean, where's the public dividend? It's all being sold back to us at inflated prices. It's, it's not good. But there, yeah, there have to be standards, but those standards have to be defined by what we call it is not entrepreneuring, which is somebody who says, hey, if I do that, I can, I can capitalize uh, the, you know, the juice out of this thing. Um, I'll do that. We have a thing, what we call it now, which is kind of the phase that we're in, and we haven't really manifested yet, but it's what we're trying to do, and we call it avantpreneuring, which means that you do things like Electronic Cafe, where you put... Uh, prototypes out into the environment. People use them. They acculturate them. They show you what the applications are. They show you what the needs are. You don't have to sit back in Columbus, Ohio and pump your stuff over Cube and get people pushing yes, no, buy, sell uh, to do market research to try to figure out what the hell people want to sell them a future. Because, you know, that it's we have to get, uh, yeah, we got to get up to speed on this a little, a little bit better than waiting for, and this whole secrecy, you know, one company doesn't want to tell the other what fragrance they're putting in their soap. So it all happens behind the curtain and then the media blitz, ta-da, buy now. And that's not the way we're going to uh, create uh, alternative uh, healthy futures for ourselves. So these, you have to empower people with the ability have access to the stuff because they don't know what the values are. If I had an electronic cafe for $75, there's no market for it because people don't understand what value is in it because they haven't had the privilege to use it to liberate their imaginations to apply it to their own value system. So you have to put it out there and then let people define it. And that determines where the market's going. Now, to me, that's a more efficient use of human and material resources, but it's got to make sense. Well, I guess my question was, um, if I wanted to buy one of your packages, uh, uh -huh. how exactly do you package these uh, techniques? Or maybe what I want to ask is, are you copywriting a technique or putting a trademark on it? Or uh, just how uh, do you package uh, your product? Uh, because I think a lot of these technologies already exist, don't they? Yeah, some, they, they do. Yeah. If you go to a, a teleconferencing trade show, you'll see, oh, there's that, that's nice, there's that, that's nice. 
all but there. That's I guess right. you put them all together. That's right. And it's yeah. the way to reduce them. Right, and it's not just putting that together, which we did during Electronic <laughs> Cafe. We said, oh, we'll take some of this, and some of that, and some of that, and we'll wire it together. And if we can't wire it together, we'll attach a human being here. So you have a copywritten package or something? Like well, that. we haven't got that far yet. Our interest is in maybe have cornering the market on providing turnkey solutions to people. We're the systems integrators, okay? What we want to do is not sell hardware. We want to sell solutions. And maybe for us, there is some gain to be made financially to uh, worm ourselves out of you know this debt we're accumulating to um, to both do what we want to do and have it underwritten by a certain demand. But what we want to do first is to create a prototype environment and then turn that all over into a public domain environment like computer bulletin board systems where people write software, they, they change it, they modify it, and they grow with it. And groups get together and determine standards and protocols and compression uh, solutions and how to do this. And those communities of interest uh, need then to, to take it from there. Um, we have put a lot of time and a lot of work and a lot of thought in all of this, and um, there's a lot that we just don't say or give out for free, and there's certain things that we consider proprietary. For example, if you wanted to do an international satellite composite image performance between a Russian dancer and uh, a French dancer or whatever, our services are available. We know how to train the people. We know how to take the shortcuts. We know how to do it. Nobody else knows how to do it. Okay. Buy here. So we have services like that that we can offer and consulting. We went to Xerox, which research park in Palo Alto. They have a, a young team of people who are using compressed video and computers and all of this stuff. And they are exploring the um, geographically dispersed design teams. You know, people, on, people in Phoenix, people in Palo Alto, people in uh, uh, Diego del Fuego. And, they all are wired uh, together all day, designing. And they have this system set up, and uh, it, was, it was ridiculous. But uh, you know, they're getting money to be ridiculous. What can I say? You know, they don't have to listen to me. I guess there's a lot of other people with questions. OK, more? Come on, where's the tough question? Two things. Are you listening? <laughs> I, one was I just wanted to ask you. We were saying something. You started to say something about when you had to take the electronic cafe down, the effect that it had on people. I just wanted to follow up on that. But one other thing I just thought of, and it, you have been working with technology enough to know, is there any, or maybe any way that holograms and video will be coming together, is there any way they can merge those technologies to have like video personas to be telecommunicated or anything? I just, That's kind is of that too far in the future? Well, it's interesting, the two questions together, because one is so concrete, you know, one is so real, and the other one is so way out there. Out there. <laughs> out there. I like the, uh, in the, in the new, uh, I don't particularly like the new series, but if anyone has seen uh, Star Trek, The Next Generation, they have the holodeck. Have you seen that? It's where you go on ship, and there's like 10 or 12 of them. You go in, you program an environment. I want to go to New Orleans, 1958 uh, jazz combo, and a sultry woman sitting at the bar. And, and there you are, you know, the piano's playing, and you go in there. And, you know, that's pretty wild. Is that possible? I don't know. I won't live to see it. I, I'm yeah, or like sure. video clones of yourself that you could send somewhere, and they could pick up images and everything and be like, what the heck? Make you can, uh -huh. um, holograms, uh, the idea, the desire is there. It's been there for a long time. It's been registered a long time. Um, has anyone seen uh, Things to Come, H.G. Wells? Uh, remember the part at the end where they're in the underground city and the, uh, the craftsman is uh, broadcasting through the plexiglass television system to the whole city saying, uh, what is this progress? Must man go ever onward and onward? And is there any rest? And 
There's uh, like a city size screen and a round uh, tubular hologram and people are standing around and watching this you know, three dimensional figure uh, go on about all, all, all this stuff. And you know, uh, it doesn't exist. And um, we have to think of tearing out this copper that goes to our house and not just be settled for some ISDN uh, running to your house, but let's look at full bandwidth fiber optics get out of the way, uh, all you can eat, broadband technology, you know, and we'll fill it. Okay, you don't have to decide what, uh, what we're going to do, you know, just clear, you know, get out of the way. And uh, absolutely, except what you want to sell <laughs> sometimes. I mean, we there, it gets more, it, get, it gets pretty complex and, um, but there, you know, there's a way to do it. It's understood. It just takes some uh, political stuff. So, um, you know, ISVN is like a short little hop. It's like from the Mac to the uh, Mac 2. It's kind of like, uh, okay, let's take a big leap into the future. And it's like, boop. You know, and everybody's waiting for the new gizmo to come out. When the new gizmo comes out, then we can really do something. So everybody's perpetually waiting for the new gizmo. Now, my theory is with the IBM bus, and since they've abandoned it, and since it's an international standard, that in that environment one can build a telecommunications revolution because it's essentially abandoned folk technology. There's enough power for the first time historically to have a telecommunications revolution. So we can build the machines to re-socialize. And what that does is put us politically right to the confrontation of why in the hell does it cost so much for me to call this guy over here? We gotta change that now, you know, the work's never done. <clears throat> However, it seems like part of what can be accomplished by all this is getting people all over the world involved in this design. Yeah, I agree. And we need that kind of... Uh, to me, the computer of the future is going to be, uh, you tell the computer who you are. This is what I like, this is what I do, this is what I want. What's taking so long? Get it for me. And it's your clipping service, it goes out there. And you at home have different tiered levels of uh, security. You have your junk mail up here. I'm interested in this kind of junk mail. All the junk mail goes here. Things that you subscribe to and pay to, pay for, go at another level. Uh, your other human interests and exchanges are at another level. And then there's the information that you have online that is for sale, that people come in and you have a billing system like the telephone company and people come in and they download your programs and you're reimbursed for them. And anything you want to keep secret, you take it away in a box and you set it over here. Because I don't think there's any way they can make a spark hop from there, get your information and hop back. And uh, that's, those, that's the kind of stuff that we need. But, Imagine the chaos when everyone's talking to each other and we don't have any more man uh, information management software than we have right now. I mean, already I've got like, you know, 500 Mac disks, you know, I, the pesky uh, cluttering up the place. So there is that whole other aspect of how then do we deal and cope with this information overload. And that's basically just a design problem and you just throw a lot of cheap memory at it. And, um, you know, then you ultimately have to make uh, the end decision. Are we out of time? Yeah. I think any uh, further questions that you have for Kit and Sherry, you can ask them directly. Uh, we'll be having a reception. Uh, there's uh, wine and beer and chips available. Um, they'll be around if you'd like to talk to them. Thank you very, very much. For